23, verses 1 to 21, and can be found on page 728 of the Church Bible. But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead, since you are precious and honoured in my sight, and because I love you. I will give men in exchange for you, and people in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. <coughs> Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf, all the nations together and the peoples assemble. Which of them foretold this and proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so they, that others may hear and say it is true. You are my witnesses, declared the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will be there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no saviour. I have revealed, saved, and proclaimed. I am not some foreign god among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is what the Lord says your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. This is what the Lord says. It is he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together. And they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honour me, the jackals and owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Thank you very much. Before I get going, I'd just like to take this opportunity to say thank you all for your prayers, for all those of you who've been involved in the vacancy. Thank you for the gifts that you left us, which was a lovely surprise. We turned up at half past eight on, uh, on the Wednesday evening, rather tired, having packed everything up and driven all the way down, facing a 75-minute delay on the M6. It was a lovely gift, a uh, lovely thing to come to. Um, so thank you very much, and thank you for that card. We'll have great pleasure in reading that over the, uh, probably this afternoon, I imagine. It's been an interesting few weeks, hasn't it? Depends how you take that. I was meaning it for myself. It, could, it may well have been interesting here. It's, of course, been interesting in our country as we watch the news and wonder just what is going to happen. 
For me and Amanda, just over five weeks ago now, I finished my curacy with the Ingleborough team, where I'd been for just over three years. We then disappeared three days later off to New Wine, which, of course, I'm sure you know, week two was cut short because of the wind. We then got home, had about three days, and we left Yorkshire for our adventure down here. House was packed up. We moved down. We camped tonight on airbeds. Our furniture arrived the day after. And since then, we've been surrounded by boxes and boxes and more boxes. And there are still a fair few that haven't yet been unpacked. Then, of course, we got to Wednesday evening for the licensing collation. I'm never quite sure what their proper name is for these things. But in many ways, it's been a complete whirlwind of events, and it's meant that Amanda and I haven't actually had a normal for a while. Now, in many ways, it's been incredibly exciting. As we move down, this is the first house that we've been able to set up together, as I was already living in uh, the curate's house when we got married. So we've both had the chance to settle in and sort out where things are going in the house. We've chosen paint for the rooms. We've had two or three of the rooms downstairs decorated, and Andrew's come in in tomorrow to do a little bit more for us. We've chosen carpet. I've built lots of flat-packed furniture. I'm not building any more for a while. <laughs> We've given stuff to charity, all the usual things that come as you move house. But it's also been a time of sadness, as we've said goodbye to friends. We said goodbye to family, obviously not forever, but as we'll no longer be as close to them. And it's been lovely to have friends with us this week and for Graham to be with us this last week to share with us as we begin this journey with you here. But in saying all of this, the most exciting part for both of us is that we're finally here. I'm aware, obviously, you've been in vacancy for a few months and have been praying for a new vicar to come. Amanda and I have been living with the prospect that we're coming here for a few months. I think it was back in March where we first looked at the profile. We put it to one side. We came back to it. We put it to one side. We prayed and we discerned if God was actually calling us to apply for this post. Because I might as well say it now, I wasn't sure I wanted to come south. <laughs> God has a sense of humor he really does, because when I was a lawyer, I, was try I got a training contract to become a solicitor, and I remember saying to my mum and Graham, I don't really want to do the training contract, because it means I have to go down to Bristol for six months. So I sensed a call. I resigned from that position, and where did God send me? Plymouth. <laughs> so I should have expected it. I should have expected that God would have a sense of humor and be a God of surprises. Of course, we've been making that change in our minds of what we did with the Ingleborough team, what we did up there, how they looked out for us, how they looked after us, how we looked after them. And Amanda and I have been thinking and praying, what will ministry mean here in Bushmead? What's that going to look like for the both of us as a couple? Well, the conclusion we came to is that it'll be very different. And I don't mean that in, in a light way at all. Of course it's different. We haven't got tractors driving past our house day and night, seven days a week. I haven't heard a sheep bar since I've been in Luton. <laughs> but we've got used to hearing neighbors in the street, hearing cars pass us by. Of course, these are all superficial things though, aren't they? It'll also be different here as I am the vicar, not the curate. It'll be different in the way Amanda and I work together as we lead this church here. There'll be lots of new things for me to learn, for me to understand. And I'm sure for the next few weeks, you may well see me and just think, he looks like a rabbit caught in headlights. I hope not. But there is going to be lots of things to learn as I, as I get to know each of you, as you get to know us, and as we seek what God's will is for us as a church going forward. That does get me really, really excited to see what God has in store for us as a church. But it also makes me nervous. 
And if I hadn't have been nervous on Wednesday, then I'd have been quite worried because a friend of mine once said to me, the moment you stop feeling nervous is the moment you stop. Because when we're nervous, we know that we have to rely on God. We have to step in and trust God. I have a little plaque on my desk that says, trust in the Lord with all your heart from Proverbs, and he will show you the path to take. And when we're nervous, particularly when I get nervous, and Amanda will tell you, I can be quite nervous. And I can be a little bit awkward sometimes if I'm really nervous. But I know that that's when I have to trust in God and lean into him. But we are both incredibly excited to get to share our lives with you, to get to share in your lives, to walk alongside you, and to discover where God is calling us. Of course, we had the passage from Isaiah this morning. Now, parts of that passage, I imagine, are very well known to a lot of you. And I'm going to actually start at the end of the passage with the last section, and then go back to the beginning, and hopefully it will make sense as I speak why I am doing that. And I did think, as it's my first time preaching here, I should be a good Anglican and use three points. (laughs) But before we get to point one, it just helps, I think, to put this passage into a little bit of context. At the end of chapter 42, before the passage we had, we hear about the Lord's people in the Lord's fire. But at the start of the reading, we then hear the Lord saying, he will not allow that fire to burn them. And if we look at the language used, it begins, but now. So it connects us to what's happened before. Israel has been revealed as blind, inattentive, falling short of the Lord's plan, defeated, sinfully disobedient, spiritually uncomprehending, and insensitive. So it's fair to say that things weren't going too well. So they must have feared when Isaiah said, but now, this is what the Lord says. I wonder if they were waiting for an almighty telling off. That feeling you get when you've done something wrong and realize you need to go up and apologize. Of course, this isn't what happens because the Lord says, you are mine. He has created and formed us. He wants redemption for our people, for his people. And he wants a personal relationship with them. Isaiah is speaking to a group of exiles, and the people hearing this will have been well aware of all the hardships that they'd had to endure. So the words of Isaiah 43 must have come as a comfort to them. I'm not saying that we've been in exile, but it helps to put it into a little bit of context what I want to explore this morning. And I want, as I go through this, I hope that we'll be able to look at what I'm saying, both on a personal level for us individually but also corporately as Christ church. So the first point I have is that the Lord always has greater things in store. Now those of you that are in new wine are probably thinking, hang on a minute, I heard Paul Harcourt speak on that. <laughs> well, he did. And actually, the very, when he started speaking, when Paul started speaking, I got a real sense of the Lord just saying to me, you need to listen to this. It was one of those moments when you know that the Lord is saying to you, you've got to listen. Not just listen, but actually take it on board and follow it through. Paul talked about God doing a new thing and being in a new season. Well, of course, here at Christ Church, we are in a new season. Well, I mean, to be honest, it's not that difficult to work out, as Amanda and I have just joined you. And I know there's been a lot of talk about a new season but I believe that there is more to this. Of course, there are things that happen in this church already. You know, Amanda and I aren't coming in here and starting from scratch. We're going to pick up things that have been going. It's great to read the notice here and see just how much is going on in Christ Church. And that came through in the profile and got both of us really excited. Do not remember the former things, though, can seem as quite a strong command. But it's not saying forget everything that has happened. What it's saying is that if we're looking back, we're missing the point. So we need to be focused on going forward. We need to be looking, discerning, and seeking what's the Lord calling us to do now. Of course, we learn valuable lessons from the past. Some good, some not so good. And over the next few weeks, I want to begin and learn and understand where Christchurch has been 
and where you feel you are in the here and the now. And once we've looked at that together, we can then start to discern together what's God calling us to do next, both here as a church, in Bushmead, and in Luton. On Wednesday night, when I was upstairs, the bishop said to me, you don't need to fill the shoes of your predecessors. And that's true, like Dean said, after all, I'm, I'm not the people that you've had before. I am my own person. I will have different gifts to them. But under God's guiding hand, with all of you, I hope to discover where is God calling us next in this new season to greater things. Now, that's not a question I can answer immediately, of course. It will take time. And it's not something I can do on my own. It's what we need to do corporately, together. Where is God calling us to? And I'm sure you're well aware that things won't necessarily go as we plan. In verse 21, God says, The people I formed for myself, which gives us the idea of the potter's hand forming each one of us individually. But it means that we can face the pressures that life will throw up at us. And not just face them, but face them with confidence. And I'm well aware that as we work together, as we discover what is God calling us to do, it's not going to be plain sailing. And we will have battles to face. Some may be internal, some may be external. Some will come from places that we don't even expect it. But if there aren't any battles, then clearly we're doing something wrong. I'm not saying we're all going to fall out with each other. The battles are often a lot more subtle than that, as I'm talking about spiritual battles. They creep up on us before we know it, and they can impact the way we behave. And more often than not, we need somebody else to point it out to us. Shortly after we moved here, I was really struggling to sleep for a week, and I felt a real heaviness. I was struggling to get things done as everywhere I looked, there was another box and another 10 jobs to do. And all it felt like Amanda and I had done for the first week was move boxes around the house and not actually get anywhere. But clearly we hadn't because there was lots of boxes that had been flattened and placed in the garage. But it was all the little things that nagged. I had a great escapade with a filing cabinet, which I won't share with you now, but do ask me about that later. But it was all the little things that kept nagging. And it wasn't until one evening when Amanda and I were chatting and she said, we haven't prayed about this. So together we prayed that night for the Holy Spirit to come and remove anything that wasn't of God. Believe you me, I slept very well that night. But it needed Amanda to point it out to me. And the day after, I felt much lighter and lighter. So when God is about to do something, when he is on the move, there will be battles that we face. Some will be subtle and gradually build, as happened to me recently. But others will be far more obvious. We need to be ready to fight those battles that come our way. It reminds me of the song Surrounded, which we sung at New Wine last year. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. So as we journey on together, let us fight those battles that will inevitably come our way. But let us fight them by being surrounded by God and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide us and equip us. We pray into the battles. We find a trusted friend or friends, a prayer partner. We pray for guidance and we pray for wisdom as we enter this new season and look forward for the greater things that are to come. Secondly, we are all called by God. Each and every one of us. So I'm now going to jump back to the start of the passage. Because as Isaiah says at the start, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And friends, this is for each and every one of us gathered here this morning. We're all called by God to build the kingdom here on earth. 
And I'm aware that within the church as a, as a, as a big body, I'm not meaning just Christ's, but as a wider body, the church, too often that idea of calling has been placed on church leaders. And a calling is when you stand up at the front of church and lead or speak. Well, that's an assumption that needs to be challenged because it doesn't say anything about that in the Bible. We are all called by God and we all have multiple callings. But we're not all necessarily called to lead a church. But we are called in our lives, maybe as a teacher, an office worker, a taxi driver, a pilot, a bin person, a stay-at-home mum or dad. The list goes on. We're also called as mothers, fathers, sons and daughters. And the language of calling needs to be recaptured for the whole people of God. So I want to ask you this morning, what do you think your calling is? Where do you sense God calling you? How can you build the kingdom where you are now? In your street, with your neighbors, in your workplace, in any social groups you're part of? And as I've mentioned, as we step out into that calling, we will face opposition. But we have those promises of Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Isn't that an incredible promise from God? So as we step out, we can remember those promises. I've asked you the question, what do you think your calling is? As we get to know you, I would love to know what is your calling? What makes you tick? Where do you work for God in your lives? And I'd love to discover how God is equipping you to live out that calling. If you're not sure what that calling is, maybe it's a new thing to you, then do come and speak to me and together we can explore what it is that God might be calling you to do. But don't just share with me, share with each other. Share with one another, as it's often when we share with others, people think, well, I've seen that in you, it's only taken you six months to work it out. It wasn't until somebody said to me, have you considered ordination? And 30 minutes later when my jaw left the ground, that I realized, okay, perhaps I do need to explore this. And then it was in, at Spring Harvest in 2012, I, if we were in the big top, I could take you to the exact seat where I was sat, where I sensed God say to me, you need to explore ordination. We were singing the song, Lord, for the years. We got to the line, past put behind us, for the future takers, and something clicked. And I realized that actually what people were saying to me was not just what they were saying, but it was what God was saying to me. So maybe you've had a similar experience of calling. Maybe you don't, as I say, maybe you don't know what it is, but listen to each other, share with one another. You all know each other far better than I know you at the moment, than Amanda knows you. But over time, as we get to know each other, let's discover what is God calling us to do individually and corporately. Because we are called together corporately as a body, as the church. And as I say, I'm really excited to see where is God calling Christ church? What is he asking us to do in this new season? Now I know you will all have your own ideas of that, of where you feel the church should go. And I want to hear those. I want to hear from you where you feel that we should be putting our energy. And as we do that, then we as a PCC with the wardens and myself, we can discern together and look, where do we focus our efforts? How can we best serve the Lord here in Bushmead? And to aid that, in the first few weeks, I hope to get around all the different groups that happen and just get to know you in a setting that's not a Sunday, because as we often know, Sundays can be quite busy. There's lots of people. It's often not that easy to chat to each other on a deeper level. So I want to get around the groups, get to know you all in smaller groups, and then work out what is God calling us to do. As I've said, this isn't an instant or overnight decision. This will take time, 
And I don't want us to rush it. It has to be done prayerfully. We have to be seeking, what does God want us to do? And it's not just something we'll do now. And then in a few months say, this is what we're going to do. It's something we'll keep revisiting. We'll be guided by the Holy Spirit. See, when is the Spirit prompting us to do something different? When is he prompting us to change our focus? When is he prompting us to stop doing something? So it's not just starting, but it may be that we're being asked to stop something. Because as we know, everything has its time and its season. And sometimes we just need to be brave enough to say, the end has come. Now it may well be that that isn't the case. But I encourage each of us to pray into what we're involved in. See what the Lord is asking of us. See what the Lord wants us to do. And as I've said, be prepared to be surprised. Because we will come up with our ideas. We will come up with our vision. And I'm sure the Lord will say, that's your vision. This is my vision. Let's work together. And finally, God promise, God's promises to us. God has made promises to us. As we heard at the start of Isaiah 43 about walking through the fire and the water. But God also says, lead out those who have eyes but are blind in verse 8. And in verse 10, you are my witnesses. Well, friends, this includes you and me. There are many out in the world who have eyes but are blind. And it's part of our calling, first and foremost, as Christians, to go out and share God's love with everyone. Often this can be just by the way we act. I once saw a poster that said, you are the only Bible some people will ever read. Well, if that's the case, we need to be living according to biblical principles. I know it's not easy. But I'm yet to find in the Bible where it says being a Christian is easy. Even the archdeacon said that to me on Wednesday night. He said, if you think you're coming here for an easy ride, Tim, off you go now. <laughs> and that's true for each and every one of us. Whatever, in whatever circle we are, wherever we do, being a Christian isn't easy. If anything, it's harder than those who aren't. Because some people think that when you become a Christian, everything works out. Life becomes easy and perfect. Oh, well, look at them. They've got it all together. Look at them. They're all sorted. But as you know, that, can be f that couldn't be further from the truth. Because each and every one of us here have experienced difficulties in our lives. I know that we have. I don't know you yet, but I know you will all have difficulties that you faced in one form or another. Some will have been difficult since you've come to faith. Some will be experiencing difficulties now, sat in amongst this congregation. Some will have difficulties corporately, not just personally. But together, surrounded by your brothers and sisters, we can share with each other and support one another and help each other. And those of you that are struggling, we will carry you as a church. Because you will reciprocate when it's one of us that's struggling. And it's amazing that in these three days, however long it's been since Wednesday, since I've started, I've already heard of so many stories of how you as a church have helped different people. As people have come and introduced themselves to me, they've said, Christ Church did this for me when I was struggling. Christ Church did that for me when I was struggling. And that is such a joy to hear. It is so encouraging when we support one another because that's what we're called to do as the body of Christ. As I said at the beginning, I'll have different gifts from predecessors. You will all have different gifts. And when we work together, we bring our gifts together as the body of Christ. And then we can really work for the kingdom. But of course, even in the dark valleys, we know that God won't leave us or forsake us. We know that God is with us. As we sang this morning, even thy walk. I can't remember the rest of the words now. It's gone straight out of my head. But the, we sung the song by Matt Redman. And it just re, re that point that actually God is always with us. 
So verses 8 to 13 give us that sure promise. And it's scarily relevant to us today. Isaiah's people are likely surrounded by gods of other, other faiths, other gods, and their devotees. So they need to get their theology straight. They need to know that actually we worship the Lord. We don't worship these other gods. We worship the Lord. Well, friends, if we think of our world at the moment, how many other gods are out there? How many other things are vying for our attention all the time? Money, status, idolatry, the latest and greatest gadgets. And I'm afraid I fall foul of that one. Social media. As you heard on Wednesday from the Archdeacon when he shared most of my secrets, that my dissertation was about social media and how it's impacting our relationship with God. And I hope at some point I may be able to share some of that with you. And I'm sure on that list, many more, you could come up with many, many more. And if we were to have a board up here, I'm sure we'd fill it and then there'd still be many left over. But in a world where we're switched on 24-7, there's often no let-up of news constantly streaming to our mobiles. It's easy to get lost in amongst that and lose sight of the Lord. But verse 11 is where we're told it straight. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I, even I, am the Lord. And apart from me, there is no savior. Because we're not going to find salvation in money, in material possessions, or in anything else. We're only going to find salvation in the Lord. Who can effectively deliver in all of the world's adversities? I don't need to give you the answer, because I know you know it's the Lord. In verse 12 and 13, we get further affirmation of this. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. The Lord has revealed himself to us, and we know it's only he who can save. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. So if we are his witnesses, let us proclaim his name. Let us proclaim that he is Lord over all. That he is Lord over all the circumstances we face as individuals. He is Lord over all of the circumstances we face as Christ Church. He is Lord over all of the circumstances that we face as a worldwide church. He is Lord over all the circumstances that we face as a nation. And boy, do we need that at this time. And he is Lord over all the circumstances we face as a world. The Lord says, what I act, when I act, who can reverse it? When God moves and acts, things happen. Things change. So we need to be ready and open for God to show us, to stir us up, to move us in the power of the Holy Spirit, to equip us for what he's calling us to do. There's so many different cartoons around at the moment on Facebook that say, you know, it's somebody sat with Jesus saying, why are you letting all this poverty happen? Why are you letting homelessness happen? And Jesus comes back and says, well, I could ask the same question to you. Sometimes when we pray, the answer to our prayers has to be that we act. When we pray for people who are homeless, it's not necessarily that there'll be some mighty act of God And all those homeless people will find some shelter. It may well be that when we pray, help the homeless, that God is saying, well, you've got a spare room. You've got an afternoon on a Wednesday. You can go and help at the food bank. You've got an afternoon. You can go and help with a a different charity. It may well be that as we pray, we get stirred up and we are encouraged to act. And I encourage you, as you pray for the state of the world, the state of the nation, Be, allow the Holy Spirit to stir you up. Igni- allow the Holy Spirit to ignite a passion deep in your heart so that you can then work that out and help, even if it's just one person that you help. To that one person, that will mean the world. We don't have to do grand things like save 3,000 people off the streets. Start with one. Start with one person. I'm using homelessness as an example, obviously it may not be that for you. 
But you get the point. Start with one and see where it goes. So to sum up this passage from Isaiah, God has got a new thing for us. Of that I'm sure. We are in a new season. So let's be attentive to God and the Holy Spirit. Let's discover what he's calling us to do. As I've said, God calls each and every one of us. None of us are exempt from that. It's part of being a Christian. We all have God's call on our lives. Maybe we haven't found it yet. Maybe we're in a season of change. Maybe we know what we need to be doing. Maybe we're exactly where we need to be. But share and encourage one another in our callings. Do that to me as well. Share with me. Tell me. Just because I'm here. Share with me if you think something isn't right or something needs to be changed or something's going really well. Please do encourage me. But share and encourage with each other. I hope you already do that. But I hope as I get to know you over these coming weeks and months that you will share with me what's important to you what God has put on your heart because we are the body of Christ together. And finally, know what God has promised, that he will show up and he will act. So whatever it is that we're facing, however we're feeling, know that God is with you. We, your brothers and sisters at Christ Church, are with you. And let us also be prepared for a move of God in this place. Let us prepare for the Holy Spirit to release new gifts to us, to allow us to continue the work that's gone before, to allow us to build on that, and to allow us to, to change and, do, and move forward in the coming years as we journey on together. We are both incredibly excited to be with you. We are both incredibly excited about what God is going to do here. And I hope you are too. I hope you're excited that there's a little flame inside your heart that God is igniting as we start this new journey together. I want to pray as I come to an end. I encourage you, open your hands as a sign that you're willing to receive. And I'm going to pray and then I'll leave a space of silence. Take that silence to, to talk to the Lord yourself. And see what is he asking you to do. So Father we thank you for your promises. We thank you for the call on our lives. Help us to know what you're asking us to do individually. Help us to discern what you're asking us to do corporately. Bless each and every one of us. Send your Holy Spirit to equip us for the task ahead. Speak to each of us now. Guide us and lead us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. And please do, if anything has struck a chord with you or something, please do speak to me or Dean, and we will be more than happy to pray with you about whatever it is, whether it's a call or something else that I've said. Please do find me and Dean, and we will be more than happy to pray with you.